Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Joachim. Good morning. Morning. Are we all ready to start? I think we are. So welcome, Bokil Tov. This is um, our Dutch-Israeli mini symposium on hydrogen and renewable energy. Uh, we have been conducting these uh, symposia for the last few months now at the embassy, and um, we have a specific focus in the field of uh, hydrogen. And I will firstly invite my colleague Jochem Durenkamp from the uh, New Energy um, um, Initiative to say a few words. Yes, thank you, Rachele. Good morning, everyone. Um, indeed, working for New Energy Coalition. As, um, I have actually two roles, uh, New Energy Coalition. My colleague Patrick is here as well, working for the uh, Business School of New Energy Coalition, Energy Delta Institute, where I'm uh, responsible for the hydrogen portfolio, but also working for the Heaven Project, which will be discussed later by Patrick Krummen in more detail. Um, Rachel and I organized a symposium, and I see some uh, familiar faces that you joined as well on the 1st and 2nd of September. And where um, actually this was a masterclass in hydrogen. But one of the objectives of this, ma this masterclass was to see if there's a, a, a cooperation opportunity between the Netherlands and Israel. And today is a follow up of this um, uh, masterclass and see how the Netherlands and Israel can potentially work together in this field. Um, thank you very much for the invite, uh, Rachele. I give the word back to you. Thank you, Jochem. That's great. And uh, we love follow-ups. That means we would like mm -hmm. to also to see a follow-up from, from this event. Our program today is comprised of seven speakers. Um, and uh, I will introduce every speaker. Um, we will end our meeting at one o'clock Israeli time, 12 o'clock uh, the Netherlands. Um, I would also like to um, tell you that the ambassador, um, His Excellency Hans Doctor, could not join our meeting and uh, please accept his apologies, but his thoughts uh, are totally with us. So um, we can start and I'd like to please introduce our first speaker, Dr. Engineer Patrick Knoeben, who is the project manager uh, in the field of hydrogen at the New Energy Coalition uh, in Groningen. For Israelis, the region of Groningen is a region we know very well because Shell is situated, is situated there. Uh, Patrick is also a board member of the Israeli Dutch Innovation Center, which we established in 2016 at uh, the Dutch Embassy in Israel. Patrick is a chemical engineer by training as well as a chemist. He has been involved with the Energy Valley Foundation and is responsible for the realization of large scale investments in the field of bioenergy and gas, enhancing amongst else the production and use of biogenic energy carriers, such as green gas, bio liquid, uh, natural gas and hydrogen. And Patrick is the architect of HEAVEN, which is an acronym for the, Netherlands, the Northern Netherlands Hydrogen Valley Project. Patrick, the floor is yeah. yours. Good morning, everybody. And uh, who, wouldn't be, who wouldn't like to be the architect of HEAVEN? So, uh, okay, let me let me see how to get this on the, the share screen. Oops, no. It can be seen and everything okay like this? Perfect. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Patrick, Patrick Neven, as, uh, as Rochelle uh, mentioned. I'm a colleague of Jochem, who uh, also did uh, some of the introductions. And I want to uh, take you along on the way on how it came that we prepared this project called called heaven and what are the backgrounds mm -hmm. but also i try to get into a discussion on what would be the potential uh, and the interest for uh, for israel um, to also get engaged into hydrogen which is something which is uh, very uh, strongly promoted at this time in europe but i think in general all over the world because it's it has certain advantages and uh, it's clean and it could help us battle combat the uh, the ever increasing, um, let's say, uh, climate change, which we notice all over the place. Okay, I named my presentation Power to the Molecules because that's what it is actually, uh, because hydrogen is no more than, than tint, canned electricity. And by canning it, you can transport it and bring it to, let's say, various applications, which 
in general now uh, are connected by uh, natural gas. So it has some let's say, advantages and specifically in our region, that is something which is very, uh, very interesting that well. So I'm going to talk about heaven. It's a EU flagship. It's the first hydrogen valley initiative in uh, project in, in Europe, Europe, the hydrogen valley project being funded by Europe. And there are a lot of initiatives, which is a, which is a, well, it's a, it's under, under, understatement because a, a lot of things going on and I've had some next steps in it, but also have some, some giveaways if you have some specific questions. Well, first you may notice this is the, the North Sea, the blue part and the, the green part is the Northwestern mainland of Europe. We are located here. That's uh, let's say what we traditionally call the Energy Valley region, which is now being transformed into a hydrogen valley region where this project heaven is taking place amongst with uh, together with a lot of other uh, uh, projects. Well, um, well, if you look at the coastline, the reason why we are uh, let's say engaging in this process tiles hydrogen um, is based on the the fact that in 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 this region here the largest onshore gas field of europe is located so-called slochteren field which has brought there's a lot of prosper which has brought the netherlands and the northern netherlands a lot of prosperity uh, but also some troubles namely uh, uh, some uh, minor relatively minor earthquakes triggered by the gas extraction that has resulted into the decision of the government two years ago to uh, shut the field down. And this field is, is a very big field, which is actually also the start of the European gas roundabout. So every uh, every corner in Europe is connected more or less to, to this gas field and other gas fields which are connected to these gas pipelines. Well, if we stop this extraction, it will give a, let's say, tremendous a, 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 a shake to the regional economy. We we estimate that the regional economy could have a negative effect of about ten to eleven percent, even twelve percent uh, uh, lower e economic, uh, let's say, prosperity. So we uh, started thinking about a you know an alternative together with uh, Professor Art van Wijk some five five years ago, and we named this idea uh, the green hydrogen economy in the Northern Netherlands. We know natural gas that's creating business. A region needs a business, stepping out of natural gas leaves a gap. And we think that hydrogen can fill this gap. So hydrogen could be, green hydrogen could very well be our next business model for the region. And what, what you're seeing here is, let's say, the North Sea, uh, where a lot of gas fields are located, there are also a lot of gas extraction wells on the North Sea, obviously, but also the North Sea will be a very big energy park because of the windmills, which are being uh, situated there. So this power comes on shore and there will be a certain uh, moment in time that the power cannot be redistributed into the back, into the hinterland, the back country. And uh, that congestion can very well be tackled with thinning the hydrogen into, uh, thinning the electricity into hydrogen. And hydrogen can then be evacuated via the natural gas pipelines. That's the basic idea. Well, so what, what, what do we want to achieve in the region? We want to become an integrated hydrogen economy. This is a European buzzword, integrated hydrogen economy, which actually says we are here. So we have some fueling stations, etc., and some smaller applications, and we want to go there. We want to have hydrogen deeply penetrated into our economy and let's say uh, in the ideal case, use it in any uh, application, which is now a natural gas application. That can very well be done. Some slight changes uh, need to be uh, need to be uh, let's say implemented, but it's not rocket science. It's just a complex operation, but it can be done. Well, why are, why is our region now so well positioned? As I stated, we have let's say the gas experience. We have access to vast potentials of wind energy on the North Sea, but probably the wind energy on the North Sea will not be sufficient to power a part of Europe. So we need import of green hydrogen to, let's say, fulfill all the desired energy uh, requirements. We have in the region a very large, let's say, chemical industry, which is already experienced in, in hydrogen because of the fact that they use a lot of natural gas, which in many instances is being converted into hydrogen as a, as a chemical feedstock. As I said, we have the gas transmission lines. We also have a very interesting asset that is potential for 
large scale underground gas storage, which can be um, repurposed and new built to also accommodate hydrogen storage. That's very important because if you want this system to function, you need a kind of a hard lung principle. The hard is the production of the hydrogen and the lung is the storage. Otherwise the system will not work. So, and storage being the holy grail, talking about heaven, let's say of uh, sustainable energy, this, this, this storage is essential. Um, as stated, we have the potential to, to scale up, also export, but also import hydrogen by land and sea using the gas pipelines. Um, and that, then, then, for instance, um, the specific um, bullet that put in, uh, we do see that that's a mobility is very in interesting starting point because if you use the hydrogen in, in 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 industry, it needs to be large volume and cheap. And the mobility, uh, the, the the volumes aren't so big yet as the requirement in uh, the industry, but there is a premium uh, for the gas and the diesel. So there is a is an interesting uh, business case there, which helps promoting the, the bigger use, the, the more uh, strongly, let's say, promoting use of hydrogen in the other sectors of uh, the economy. And in our region, we are particularly proud that our regional governments are very much promoting hydrogen. And that's a, that's very welcome because this, this is, a, it's not a cakewalk, it's hard work, it's a complex operation. Uh, so we need all the support we can get. And that's not only from the perspective of the region, it's also nationally, but also internationally recognized due to the fact that we also uh, been awarded the Hydrogen Valley of Europe through uh, the funding of this Heaven proposal. Well, Heaven, its abbreviation stands for Hydrogen Energy Applications in Valley Environments in the Northern Netherlands. Slight hint of the transition of the Energy Valley region becoming a Hydrogen Valley region. It's a project we are the, uh, the coordinator 29, even 31 at the moment, parties from seven UE, uh, seven countries, uh, Netherlands, of course, uh, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, UK, and Spain. And there are a lot of other countries which are involved in, in an observer's uh, role. All kinds of parties, large companies, small companies, knowledge institutions, experts, advisories, regional development institutions. So a lot of, lot of things going on. And we, we can um, rely on a big support uh, from uh, several parties. Uh, well, this is an overview of, let's say, the main uh, the main uh, participants. As you can see in the left lower corner to the left down, NUM is there that will be replaced by Shell. And there is Pitpoint, which is in the center up uh, below Nurion. Pitpoint will be replaced by Total, which uh, um, it's something to be, uh, well, we're not disappointed by that because these are very well-renowned, uh, strong parties which strengthen the consortium. Well, how did we manage to become a hydrogen valley? We uh, decided that we would have, um, uh, we want to, uh, let's say, reach a situation where hydrogen is being deeply implemented in, in three sectors, industry, build environment, and mobility. Uh, so we, we decided to, um, connect to the electrolyzer developments on the chemical part of Del Seal, that's in our northeastern corner where the harbors are located. A 20 megawatt electrolyzer will be um, um, uh, will be constructed there. At the time of its construction, it will be the biggest one in operation in, in the world. But after some months, it will be overtaken by others. That's not a problem. And that uh, hydrogen will be used to produce green methanol uh, as a feedstock put into, let's say, a uh, a, um, a reformer which is now being run on natural gas. Uh, the second one is a, is a 40. It's, it's actually it's going to be 80 megawatts. It's, it's an improvement. That will be hydrogen, which will be used to produce green and clean kerosene for the aviation industry. It, and there are some other projects going on. We'll come to that later. Uh, in, in We estimate that it will be 7,000 tons per year, which isn't a humongous volume, but at the time it will be a very a uh, big volume of green hydrogen producers in, in a very interesting uh, setup. We will also use the hydrogen in heat and power applications. Uh, for instance, we have a municipality, Hoogveen. There will be, in the end, 1,200 homes will be new built or retrofitted to uh, replace natural gas with hydrogen for heating purposes for, let's say, residential heat. There is a smaller uh, municipal building array in, in Groningen 
which actually will have solar rooftops, a small electrolyzer, and that hydrogen will be fed into their, let's say, um, their um, uh, energy ecosystem on that location with fueling station in it as well. We will also use the hydrogen as a backup uh, energy provider for data centers. And it's not only backup, but because we want to go a step further, because in the Netherlands, I'm not, I don't know what, what situation is in Israel, but it's very difficult to, to, to build new data centers in city centers, for instance, because the power infrastructure, the electricity systems, the, the electricity, let's say, uh, networks are overloaded. And you have to have electricity to power up a data center. So we think that by making data centers uh, energy, uh, making the divi designing the, the, the data centers in such a way that hydrogen can be used as a, uh, as a fuel will uh, overcome that they will be connected to the to the electricity grid. Actually, they could be a backup for the electricity for the electricity grid to maintain its operation. We also will do the same uh, using power packs for, let's say, uh, um, shore power energy provision. If you have a ship, for instance, it's always somewhere at the queue, and with, with these mobile systems, we can run a we can drive a container next to the ship. Put on the uh, the fuel cell and uh, uh, let's bring the electricity to the ship to to ensure that they will not uh, use their engines because the engines uh, run on heavy fuel oil in general and they are quite uh, let's say disturbingly polluting. That will be uh, I think three to four hundred tons per year. And let's see uh, how can I get I, the mobility. Uh, actually, at the moment, the region of Groningen and Drenthe have the largest zero emission bus fleet already in the world in operation 160 electric buses which will be let's see um, enlarged by 30 30 hydrogen fueled buses uh, of, of which 20 will get into operation as of mid of march this year and uh, as of the start of january next year 10 additional buses in the region of emmen will be taken into operation we have access to somewhat more than 100 passenger vehicles, 10 heavy, uh, 10 light utility vehicles, four special garbage trucks on, on hydrogen because they are doing that thing in the city centers and having them on hydrogen will reduce the nuisance. No uh, CO2 emission, of course, but also no noise, less noise and no uh, fine dust, fine particles, which is obviously something which, uh, which is very irritating for people and some very heavy duty trucks. Eight will be more in, in, in the end. And you have to think about Nikola-like trucks, 400 horsepower and more, able to, to haul a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, goods. Patrick, you yeah. have two more minutes. Is that okay with you? Um, I'm running through it very fast. Uh, some HRSs, we have an inland barge on hydrogen uh, also, uh, and I, I, I explained, we have the, let's say, the underground storage, some preparatory studies, etc., and we are, that's connecting a lot of people. And this is this is this is the game. This is a frightening picture, which is actually we have a proposal. Four clusters, and I'll run with you through the projects. Electrolyzer uh, 20, 20 and 80, a ring which brings the hydrogen from the producer to the users, green kerosene, green methanol, a 100 megawatt electrolyzer in the end, uh, underground storage, data centers, houses, uh, a new decommissioned uh, um, elect and uh, uh, electrolyzer system on the industry complex with a pipeline to a dedicated industry connected directly to a fueling station 10 buses uh, we will run the hydrogen through the region with trailers because we cannot use the pipelines all the time as i said more fueling stations a lot of vehicles and this in itself will enable costing to construct the backbone of hydrogen in the Netherlands and going through the rest of Europe. I'm finalizing now. Uh, so you can see here, uh, let's say a view of the Netherlands connected to its neighbors. And this is our heaven project, which will jumpstart this, this movement uh, into a next phase. I would advise you to become a member of the European Hydrogen Values Platform. I'm engaging with them now, seeing what are the, the requirements for Israeli parties to get connected. This is something for Europe, forget it. And have a look at the website, www.h2v.eu. Rochelle saw that last two weeks ago. 
where we launched the global hydrogen values platform. And I think that would be very interesting for Israel as well, because Israel has a lot of potential and a lot of assets, a lot of sun in the Negev could become a producer of hydrogen or a transporter or a hub for hydrogen. And I think we can, we'll come to that later, uh, Rochelle, as well, to see what would be other, let's say, uh, possibilities to connect Israel to this major development. That's as far as it goes. I hope I stayed within You're the perfect. time. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, Patrick. And um, I would now like to uh, go one uh, step further and introduce you to Professor Leo Elbaz. Leo, you are there, right? Yes, um, yes, yes that's okay. great. So uh, if for everyone I said good morning and Bokel Tov, for Leo, uh, we have to say Laila Tov because Leo is now in the States. And sorry, Leo, about the extremely inconvenient time of our mini symposium. This was, of course, not something that we knew uh, when we were planning it. So Professor Leo Elbaz um, has a PhD in chemical engineering. And after he finished his PhD, he joined the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States, who is a world leader in the development of fuel cell technology. And there, Leo uh, developed new cat uh, catalysts and advanced materials for fuel cells. After he returned to Israel, he's a professor at Bar Ilan University he decided to establish and head the Israeli Fuel Cells um, Consortium, IFCC, which is comprised of 12 leading Israeli laboratories. He's also the official representative uh, of the Israeli Ministry of Energy to the International Energy Agency's uh, Executive Co uh, Committee for Advanced Fuel Cells. And Leo will tell us about recent, recent advances in fuel cell research by the Israeli Fuel, fuel Cell Consortium. Leo, the, fu uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I hope you're seeing the slides and not the presenter view. Yes, we see the slides and we see you. Okay, good. Uh, so first of all, I'd like uh, uh, to thank you Rafael, for inviting me. And uh, I think uh, this is a very good initiative. Uh, uh, it is the second workshop that uh, I've been uh, participating in that, that you, you arranged. And uh, uh, you know, thank you for promoting hydrogen economy in Israel. So um, also thank you for the, the very kind introduction. I am the Israeli Fuel Cells uh, Consortium uh, uh, coordinator. Uh, the Israeli Consortium is, is composed of 12 members from, from all major universities in, in Israel, from the north to south. Um, we are basically divided into uh, work packages, basically focusing on different aspects of, well, originally of PEM fuel cells. Uh, but as you'll see later, uh, we, we also started working on alkaline fuel cells and other fuel cells. Uh, we are divided into three different teams the electrochemistry team, the materials team, and the testing and durability team. Uh, we basically do everything um, from, from the very, very basic design through synthesis, characterization, and testing our, of our fuel cells. And, and we, we work very closely, as you'll see towards the end uh, of this presentation, uh, with, with uh, Israeli industry mainly, but also industry outside of Israel. Uh, but here I would like to focus just on, on what's going on in Israel. Uh, we, we, for those researchers who are in the field, uh, we, we know the targets for, for pen fuel cells. Uh, we know where we are, uh, the durability being uh, one of the most challenging uh, goal uh, is one, one of our uh, biggest uh, uh, objectives. The other one, the next one would be the cost and then the activity. We are working on development of different catalyst supports to, to enhance the durability of our, uh, of our cells. Uh, we are trying to either uh, reduce the amount of platinum without uh, lowering the overall performance of the cells or completely remove uh, the use of, of the expensive platinum catalyst in our cells. Uh, as you can see uh, in, in, in the figure below here, um, as the DOE, the US DOE sees it, uh, the, the only way to, to basically get to the ultimate target and, and basically reach 
the, the break-even point with ICE engines, uh, with, with fuel source technologies today is by removing platinum completely. Uh, this is where the US at least invests most of its research power in, in uh, a big consortium, which I'm sort of in part of uh, these days uh, called Electrocat. Um, which is solely uh, uh, focused on, on replacement of platinum in, in PEM fuel cells. As I said, we, we focus on durability, cost, and, and then activity, which is the, uh, it's important, very important target, but, but we, we are closer to it today. So I'd like to go through some, some of our research highlights uh, to kind of uh, try, try to, to open your eyes to, to Israeli research in the field. And hopefully uh, from this, we will be able to also form our, our collaborations, uh, whether they be scientific or, or industrial. So as, as I mentioned before, we're working very hard to replace platinum. So on the cost side, we, we are develop, developing uh, some of the state-of-the-art transition metal complexes uh, for oxygen reduction. We've shown extremely good activity uh, with, with the, beyond the state of the art um, atomically dispersed catalyst. What you see here is aerogel based catalyst, basically high void volume of, of uh, uh, three dimensional uh, framework uh, composed of uh, porphyrins. And those of you who have been doing electrocatalysis know what the porphyrin is. Uh, basically, it, it, we have it in so many systems. One of them is our bodies. It can reduce uh, oxygen uh, efficiently if, if it works well. And this is what we show here. This is a collaborative uh, work with uh, some of the national labs in the US, both Los Alamos National Lab and Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, and, and this has been published and the follow-up paper on this one was just recently submitted. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we're doing lots of work on, on alkaline electrolyte membrane fuel cells. It's been a great investment in the field. Um, I think Israel, uh, I, I would dare to say that Israel is the lead in alkaline electrolyte membrane fuel cells. Uh, we have uh, several uh, startup companies. Some are more mature, some, uh, some are less uh, mature. Nevertheless, uh, and, and you'll hear uh, one of them at least today. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the, the investment has been great in that field. Um, this, this has been a very active field since 2007, I think, in Israel, so already 14 years. Uh, and as you can see in those charts, it, it's a bit hard to see because I didn't want to get into detail, but you can see the improvement in, in, uh, uh, in those cells. Uh, we truly believe that they could become soon an alternative to, to PEM. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge today with, with those uh, uh, fuel cells is durability. And we are now working on ways to mitigate it, both from a uh, materials perspective and uh, from, from a design perspective. Uh, we, we are wor working on other stuff that, that may be relevant both to, to um, PEM and, and uh, alkaline uh, membrane fuel cell, electrolyte membrane fuel cells. Uh, and these are catalyst supports. Uh, we are trying to enhance uh, mass transfer through a design of different uh, uh, macro and micro pores, uh, well ordered uh, supports for, for a catalyst. Uh, this has been uh, showing to be very uh, interesting and, and uh, useful approach to further improve power outputs from our fuel cells. Uh, to tackle the, the issues relating to durability, especially in PEM, uh, we are developing uh, corrosion resistance supports, some of them uh, based on, on ceramic materials, which have shown to increase the, the durability by a factor of, of uh, at least five uh, compared to, to the carbon supports that are in use. They are a bit more expensive and it's a bit more challenging to, to work with these supports, but for certain applications where you need to have high reliability, they make lots of sense. Uh, so this is something that we, we've been promoting for the past few years as well. Uh, one other thing that, that we're working on is, is development of, of um, uh, mitigation strategies for uh, uh, 
for dur durability or catalyst durability. Uh, we are trying to figure out what are the weaknesses and, and strengths of, of, of each material. Uh, we are developing different methodologies, some, some electrochemical and some not, uh, to follow the degradation and then try to give answers uh, to, to those uh, um, failure mechanisms. Uh, this has become one of our specialties. There are a few researchers in the consortium that are basically focused solely on, on, on this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, work. And uh, we, we've been very fruitful in that uh, direction as well. Um, like many others, we, we're working in membrane uh, technology, here focusing on uh, nafion, but also developing different uh, uh, membranes for alkaline electrolyte membrane field cells. Uh, another, another very challenging uh, aspect in, in, in this, uh, for, for this, this specific type of field cells. So apart from, from uh, PEM and AEMs, uh, we are also working on, on development of uh, new ideas, new concepts for, for fuel cells. Not, not, today, not considered very new, but still the, con the concept might, might not be new, but the, the achievement is, is very interesting. So uh, what you see here is uh, work that we are currently doing on reversible fuel cells, uh, basically designed for decentralized power systems. The idea here, uh, for those who don't know, uh, is now imagine that, that you have a solar cell on your house. Some may not need to imagine that, some already have them in place. Um, so if, if you have the solar cell, you can uh, uh, produce electricity during daytime, but then you need to figure out a way to, to, uh, to produce energy during the night. One, one option would be to charge and, and discharge batteries, but we all know that fuel cells are more uh, efficient and more durable. Uh, not, not more efficient, sorry, more durable and, and have a longer uh, lives. Um, and, and we're trying here to, to basically put a fuel cell that could uh, basically um, recharge our fuel. We're using a hydrogen carrier that can be recharged, uh, basically put in hydrogen uh, during daytime when we're not at home, and then uh, split it back and get the hydrogen out uh, during the night time. Uh, this, this, this systems and, and RDs have been working very well. To the right, you can see the comparison between uh, our cells, our regenerative cell and a methanol-based cell. Um, methanol is not regenerative. Um, you can see that the power outputs that we're getting from our uh, very unique uh, uh, fuel cell design uh, with our very unique hydrogen uh, uh, carrier uh, are outperforming the methanol uh, fuel cell. Uh, so we, we are very, um, these are, you know, actually put in the, the results of just, just a few minutes before uh, we started uh, this, this workshop. These are, you know, out of the oven uh, type of results, uh, which we are very uh, happy to see. So uh, this is one important direction. It's, it's important not only for us, but also uh, for the, the you know, holistic perspective of how uh, we should manage uh, our energy. Um, here in Israel, we are trying to, to promote uh, the decentralized power systems. We see that happening with, with the national electricity uh, company, which is trying to basically shift from being a producer, just uh, being uh, uh, an enabler for transporting energy. Um, they, they, they would like to, to produce less than 30% of the total en energy uh, needs of Israel. Uh, and we're seeing uh, more and more um, smaller power stations with the idea of maybe one day to have uh, each of our houses as a sort of a small power station that could be managed by a big company. So this is one solution, one solution that we really like uh, uh, today trying to promote it. So if any of you is interested, I'll be able, I'll be happy to elaborate on this later. Um, I wanted to focus on, on the work that we're doing with, in collaboration with Israeli industry. I divided it into three uh, sections. As I said before, uh, one of the biggest strengths of Israel is, is the alkaline uh, electrolyte membrane fuel cells. Uh, the two companies that are leading this field in Israel is Gencel and, and Hydrolyte. Uh, Hydrolyte uh, uh, is, is a new name for a company used to, called, uh, used to be called uh, Fiocelltech. Um, 
now that they rebranded because they are targeting uh, different uh, applications. Uh, we, we have been working uh, on and off with Gensel and Neutralite uh, for many years, uh, supporting them in, in different ways from, from basic science uh, to, to putting our students to work in, in those companies. Basically, the, you know, the, the young students that, that we uh, train and eventually get their PhDs, uh, many of them find, find themselves in, that, in those companies. So yeah. a supply of, of manpower is also important. Um, uh, Leo, one second, we have two minutes. Is that okay with you? Yeah, we're I'm, sort of... I'm finishing soon. Um, in the middle, you could see a um, few companies that are leading in the Israeli energy arena. Uh, Sonol is the second largest, second largest oil company in Israel. Uh, we are working closely, I should say, I am working closely with Sonol on, uh, on uh, building the first uh, HRS uh, in, in Israel, the first hydrogen uh, refuel station in Israel. Uh, we are planning to, to have it in the north of Israel, in, in the Haifa Bay area, uh, and this connects us to Bazan. Bazan Group uh, is, is the biggest uh, oil refinery in, in Israel, and they are now in, interested in, in uh, hydrogen as well. Uh, they produce about eight tons of hydrogen per hour, uh, gray hydrogen, that they use for their own uh, specific uh, processes uh, relevant for, for uh, um, uh, making fuels. Uh, the idea today is, is to connect them directly to Sonos, to the Sonos station, thus saving quite a bit of, of money on, on uh, uh, transportation, transportation of hydrogen. Uh, in, in this respect, I would like to say a few words. Israel is very interesting in terms of infrastructure because Israel is very narrow and it's not too long. Effectively, Israel is basically 300 kilometers long. If you count out the, 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 the areas which are, which are very relatively not, not populated. Uh, so we, we, you know, three to five HRSs, we basically cover uh, the main routes in Israel and you could travel throughout Israel uh, with no problem uh, uh, or with no fear of finding yourself uh, out of fuel. Um, for, for this reason, uh, companies like, like Hyundai and others have been interested in running experiments like they run uh, today in uh, uh, Switzerland. Other companies that are now getting interested in, in, in hydrogen is the Israeli electric company, as I mentioned before, and uh, the national company, com company was in charge of our uh, um, energy reserves, uh, the, the petroleum and energy infrastructure uh, company. Uh, we are supporting other activities. Um, some of our defense activities, uh, basically working with Mafat, which is in charge of, of innovation uh, for defense. Uh, we are working with drone, drone companies, uh, now trying to, to, to put in fuel cells in drone. Um, these are heavy duty drones, which are supposed to live anywhere beyond 100 kilograms. Imagine uh, some, some, you know, they are making ambulance drones today that, that could lift, lift you up and, and take you uh, to, to the hospital, to the nearby hospital. Uh, so they are interested in fuel cells as well and, and getting into this as, as we speak, basically. Apart from this, um, uh, Israel is now um, working on, on what we call NICE, the National Institute for Sustainable Energy. Uh, this is a precedent. Uh, we're we're going to have two universities uh, working together uh, and hosting uh, uh, this, this uh, institute, uh, which will focus, uh, among many other things, on hydrogen economy. Basically, two buildings in two, two different, two leading universities uh, in Israel with manpower facilities. The idea is basically make uh, science more, more approachable for uh, industry uh, to have prototype labs and host uh, companies uh, bigger or smaller in, in those uh, uh, buildings uh, to basically bridge between uh, what we do in our research labs and uh, those companies to have a more dynamic atmosphere as we like to have in Israel, uh, have flow, flow of ideas uh, between you know, rooms instead of, you know, between uh, uh, screens on Zoom uh, and, and basically make everything more approachable for everyone, in, including... Leo, 
for expensive infrastructure. And with that, I would like to finish and thank you all for listening and uh, for joining us. Thank you so much, Leo. And sorry that I had to interrupt you. Um, I am really grateful that you joined us and um, I'm looking forward to now introducing uh, Mark van Doren, who is the business development manager at Brightland Camelot. Mark um, has a background in chemical engineering from the Technical University of Eindhoven. And he has over 30 years of experience at DSM. DSM is a, a multinational uh, company uh, in the Netherlands in the field of chemistry and other fields as well. And later on, he worked for OCI Nitrogen. Recently, Mark uh, made a switch to use his experience to reach a sustainable world, working in a self-employed manner to develop sustainable processes on the Brightland Camelot campus. And he provides his knowledge to world screen, sorry, to world scale green hydrogen projects and funding and founding Bry H2 as an alternative to renewable hydrogen starting from torrefied biomass. Mark, the floor is yours. Okay. Let me start with uh, sharing the screen. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is what I want to talk to you about, uh, amongst others. It's uh, Bright H2. It's making uh, an alternative uh, way to produce uh, renewable uh, hydrogen. Uh, I will go into that uh, a little bit uh, more, but first I'll let me introduce the Brighton Camelot campus to you. We first had a presentation about uh, uh, Groningen, which is in the upper north uh, area of the Netherlands, and uh, Brighton Camelot campus is in the deep south of the Netherlands, so we, uh, the, the, both areas could not be further apart in the Netherlands, uh, actually. Um, but the Netherlands is a very small country, so it's, uh, it's not, uh, not such, a, such a big thing. Uh, what do we do? We are a shared innovation campus in the, in the south of the Netherlands. And um, we are working a lot on, uh, on different subjects, uh, different from, uh, from what is done at, uh, at uh, coastal areas, because uh, yeah, the, the, the Femelot campus and Gelein is, let's say, far inland uh, in Netherlands perception and therefore uh, a little bit disconnected from large amounts of uh, renewable energy, uh, which means that uh, we focus mostly in, in, in the Brightland Camel Campus on, uh, on circularity on one side. So we are also building uh, uh, one of Europeans biggest circular hubs. So focusing on circularity there and also focusing on alternative ways to produce hydrogen other than with uh, renewable energy. Um, because we think that mostly electrolysis and things are for the Netherlands are based upon coastal areas. We have uh, different facilities to do that. We have uh, pilot demo plants from, from two square meters to 20 to, to 200 uh, to 2000. So we can go uh, from, let's say, bench scale to, to demo plant uh, developments. And we have a number of offices. Uh, available, but also we're embedded in one of the biggest chemical areas, chemical clusters or chemical sites of Europe, uh, and in the middle of the whole ARA cluster, uh, which is a region which contains 40% of uh, European chemistry um, in only 2% of its surface. So it's a very condensed, very uh, uh, connected uh, actual uh, chemistry environment. And if you want to do chemistry, you need uh, continuous production of uh, large amounts of renewable hydrogen. And that is, um, at this moment, uh, given the intermittency of renewable energy, uh, the sun doesn't shine during the night, and it's not always, uh, the wind not, doesn't always blow. And in the Netherlands, the sun hardly shines, actually. Um, there is uh, there is difficulties in, in producing uh, the large amounts of renewable hydrogen in a continuous way as is needed by the chemist, chemical industry. Um, another thing is that uh, the other alternative is low carbon hydrogen, and that that would require carbon storage, and also that is quite disputed and uh, under development, although but then under the North Sea. So, um, and then compared to Israel, if you look at uh, renewable energy, 
um, I think Israel has a major opportunity because their uh, renewable energy can be made in an affordable way, uh, relatively cheap, uh, especially from the sun. Um, so uh, there's a big opportunity, an even bigger opportunity in Israel to produce, uh, let's say, uh, renewable hydrogen than in the Netherlands because of its uh, low cost of, uh, of renewable energy. And uh, wind at sea is uh, a stable a stable may but never it will never come in the neighborhood of uh, of the renewable energy cost in uh, in israel uh, the other problem that we need to solve is that we need to get rid of our addiction to uh, um, um, fossil fuels oil gas and coal they all if they once burned and most of it is burned um, do add to uh, additional uh, co2 in the air um, and that is, a, that is a problem, and we need to find alternatives to put carbon in our uh, chemistry because we, we are kind of addicted to this carbon. Um, the other thing is, of course, that although there is a lot of CO2 in the air, it's not enough to take it directly from the air. That's only 0.04%, so direct air capture of CO2 is still extremely expensive and extremely energy intensive to to move against the, uh, uh, let's say, the laws of nature, actually. Um, recycling, although, eh, so, so circularity is then a, a solution, but uh, this can never be 100%. So you need additional sources, and those sources usually come from, uh, from nature. So one of the solutions that we're looking into is, uh, is, uh, is um, using uh, biofeedstocks uh, in, a, in a smart way to produce um, a green syngas in the end. And from that syngas, you can produce via a water gas shift reaction additional amounts of, uh, of renewable hydrogen. And this is also part of the uh, hydrogen directive of the EU and as seen as uh, a green hydrogen, the same way as, uh, as electrolysis in the same way, actually. But you, next to the hydrogen, you also produce uh, pure CO2, which can be used for uh, CCU and is used for CCU and should be used for CCU uh, activities. So the CO2 is a feedstock for carbon in, uh, in chemistry. And also syngas, of course, if you have carbon monoxide, that's, uh, that's maybe an even better feedstock for a new carbon-based chemistry. Then you produce uh, char, uh, uh, very nice biochar. You can give that back to nature to feed uh, the micro elements back to the, to the trees where they come from. And you produce a small amount of energy, but that's, you're not doing this to produce energy. You're doing this to produce hydrogen. And that's where the most of the energy goes to, this hydrogen production. Now we need torrefaction as a as a as a as a as a starting point. And why do you need that? Yeah, biofeedstocks have the tendency to be very low energy, uh, have a very low energy content. And especially if you look at, for instance, straw and grass and uh, wet waste like manure, yeah, uh, and 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 those uh, those streams or scrap wood even. It has a very low energy density, and a, and a very efficient way to increase that energy density is torrefaction, it, and uh, it also prepares the uh, the material for uh, for the gasification later on because you kind of get rid of all the bad things that do prevent a very effective gasification, and the bad things in in, in bio feedstocks is water and also the, the C5 sugars that are in the hemicellulose. You need to get rid of that to produce a tar-free continuous production of, of, of syngas and later on additional hydrogen. Now that use of that gas can be done for the same applications as was given in the hydrogen valley, but I think given its continuous production, it's more suited for doing chemistry. And this technology is not new. It's, uh, there's been several years of development uh, 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 being done on this. Um, so the torrefaction, uh, as well as the, as the, as the gasification uh, of this torrefied product is on a, on a very decent TRL level. So it's ready to go to a demo scale. And of course, the water gas shift is, uh, is, uh, is already very common technology that is, uh, that is done on, on very, very large scale. So the first two parts are on a, on a very good technology level, 
and uh, should be scaled up. And they are actually, it goes quite parallel to, uh, to the status of current uh, uh, electrolysis for water electrolysis actually. But if you compare the technology, they're quite different. Uh, looking at water electrolysis, of course, if you, if you integrate the, uh, uh, the electrolysis unit with, the, with uh, the wind park or the solar park, the raw material cost is actually zero. Huh? The sun shines for free and the wind blows for free. So it's, uh, it, that is actually zero. But the investment is, of course, quite high. And water in, in some areas is also not uh, very cheap, but uh, in the Netherlands, it is very cheap. So if you look at that, uh, yeah, if you then use the electricity, you are still relatively high in the variable reduction cost. And, and the problem of the green hydrogen produced this way in the Netherlands is still a relatively high cost price, even if you imagine a very, very large scale production. Uh, and that's because the investments are extreme. The other, other side is, let's say, the blue hydrogen type of uh, production, steam and reforming with CCS, uh, with, with the storage on the ground. You have reasonable uh, raw material cost. Gas is still cheap, but your variable production costs get higher because of the cost of the CCS. Uh, you have to get rid of the CO2. And for instance, if you're in the south of the Netherlands, also distant from the sea where the intended uh, storage uh, cabinets are, your <clears throat> it's a quite a cost so this gasification of biomass is not such a bad idea because your raw material cost is relatively higher than gas but uh, the co2 that comes from it is very much usable uh, there's no ets or no no cost involved because it's short circular uh, uh, co2 and uh, you will have a quite a benefit from selling that co2 as well as selling the uh, the, the char so the, 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 the production cost for the hydrogen is becoming uh, quite interesting. And that's one of the reasons that we are focusing on this technology, which is, of course, very suited for, let's say, a moderate climate, uh, um, and, uh, because we need a lot of uh, trees and, 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 and things that grow. But um, yeah, it's, uh, and it's also very suited for an inland uh, production. Mark, you have two minutes. Is that OK? Yeah, that's OK. I can go very fast. Um, this is about uh, what goes in and what comes out. A 50 megawatt unit will produce uh, six to six and a half kilotons of uh, hydrogen. Quite a lot of CO2, which can all be used on, uh, on the Camelot side without any problem. Uh, quite some, uh, some energy, not too much, and a 10 kiloton of char. And you need roughly uh, 10 times the amount in torrified biomass and oxygen. You need also to, to get a, uh, the, the right gasification temperatures. If you have the syn gas, you can go to a number of other things, uh, which is very interesting. You can go to biomethane, you can go to renewable uh, hydrogen, you can go via fissure drops to jet fuels, um, via gas fermentation, you can go to bioethanol or even biomethanol. Uh, you can make directly, and from biomethanol, you can go to uh, bioethylene or biopropylene. So that's very interesting for a site like the Camelot site to have this as a building block. What you can do further is going from 50 to 250, and at 250 megawatts, the unit is already subsidy free, which is a very special uh, 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 yeah, given, actually, if you compare that to electrolysis. So, um, and you can roll it out to other landlocked chemical sites, which are uh, quite a lot in, the, in Europe. Um, but for that, you need to increase the torrefaction capacity and um, <clears throat> for, to provide also the green hydrogen to the mobility or the green CO2 for green chemicals. That's the, um, that's, uh, the, the end of the presentation. Uh, I give you a different focus on, 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 on hydrogen production, continuous hydrogen production, very much suited for, for an inland, inland Dutch case. And that's one of the projects that we're working on. Um, and we need all those projects in, in especially our area because as said, the ARA cluster contains 40% of, uh, of the chemical industry. It also contains 20% of all the steel factories. So the area that we're talking about is extremely energy consuming. 
and uh, needs all the hydrogen in the future that it can that it could generate and needs a lot of import on top of that too. So we would welcome a lot uh, uh, green hydrogen projects coming from Israel, where there is uh, where there is ample sunshine and relatively low renewable energy cost. Thank you very much, Mark. Maybe just to uh, focus a little bit on what we have seen so far in terms of um, the different uh, presentations. We have seen a presentation of the northern and the southern part of the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, as you can see, and I'm saying this uh, for my Israeli uh, colleagues, the, the, uh, the ecosystem is highly developed. The public-private partnerships are extremely well developed. Um, what we will hear now in the second part of our talk and we will have three parts of this talk of this um, uh, mini symposium are uh, a few startups as Israel is very strong in development of technology. And I do hear also from the Dutch side that there is an invitation to uh, develop uh, joint projects, uh, whether with the uh, northern uh, hydrogen valley or in the uh, area of uh, Gemelot. And therefore, we will hear now um, about um, uh, the uh, startup called Gencel, which was also mentioned by uh, Professor Lior Elbaz. Um, Gil Shavit is the VP business development um, with over 30 years of experience in engineering and entrepreneurship and uh, in the fields of high tech and clean energy fields. Um, his leadership has led to several bootstrap ventures. The presentation of Gensel will be given both by Gil Shavit as well as by Shelly Zagari, and Shelly is going to start the presentation. I kindly ask you because we have four more presentations till one o'clock to remain within the time frame that was given to you. Thanks and success. Thanks very much, Rocheli. It's great to be here, and uh, it's fantastic to come uh, after hearing Dr. Naman and uh, uh, Lior Elbaz and Mark Van Dorn, all of whom are, you know, coming from the academic side and offering fantastic knowledge and, uh, and mentioning that they see the great importance for combination of academics with industry. So that's exactly the, the, that's exactly the uh, relationship we want, to, um, we want to foster. And we're very interested as Gensel to be working with Dutch academics, Dutch industrial part and, and industrial partners and entrepreneurs uh, to further develop our hydrogen roadmap. So uh, GenCell Energy is a fuel cell, alkaline fuel cell provider. Uh, if you go back one to the title, I'll just say that we're going to be talking about, uh, no, go the other direction, please, kid. One, one back, uh, two more forward. I mean, backwards, two more at the beginning. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to tell you now about uh, a working case study, a project that we're already using our commercial alkaline fuel cells for, which is providing extremely reliable long duration backup, as well as um, providing services to regulate the continuous uh, voltage and stability for, um, for a, a mission critical a power user, which could be, in this case, it's a hospital, it could be, you know, a campus or a, a military base or any other uh, microgrid situation. So, um, Gensel, and you can go to the next slide. And just to say, we have a disclaimer because we have now become a public company. So, of course, everything we say is not to be misconstrued as in any way a recommendation for stock purchase. Uh, so, Gensel has been around since 2011, and that is pretty young for a fuel cell company because fuel cells need a lot of maturity to cross the barrier to commercial production. So, it's great to say that we're on the one hand young, but on the other hand mature as we've released commercial, commercial solutions to the market already in 2016. And in November, the company went public on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Uh, basically, we crossed the high barrier to commercialization by cutting costs for our alkaline fuel cells in three main innovations. First, we've succeeded to remove the noble metal in the uh, electrodes, which makes the, which makes the fuel cell uh, far lower cap X. Secondly, we have enabled, we developed a CO2 scrubber, which enables us to take the oxygen from ambient air, which reduces filtration and purification costs. 
And then on the OPEX side, we've come up with a with an um, patented ammonia cracker, which is able to extract hydrogen from a, from a liquid ammonia at a very, very low cost and highly energy efficient process. So these three um, amazing inventions have really enabled GenCell to move forward quickly in the hydrogen space. Can we go to the next slide? And uh, now the market is catching up with us. So if we can say that when GenCell came out with its first stationary commercial fuel cell, uh, the interest in it was, you know, so-so. We all know that as hydrogen uh, economy is expanding and the interest is growing and roadmaps are coming out in countries around the world from Europe to, to Australia, to the US and, and Japan. So as funds are becoming available, academia is more interested, industry is more interested and customers are, are showing more demand for fuel cells to use that hydrogen. Next slide. Uh, Gail, can you go to the next slide? Okay, I wanted to start to tell you about the advantages of our alkaline fuel cell technology. So Lior mentioned that indeed mo uh, alkaline fuel cells are still rare, fairly rare in the market. Uh, and some of the advantages they offer are their extremely high electrochemical efficiency, as well as our ability to withstand very extreme weather conditions to, to be able to operate in a very, very broad temperature range from very low to high, um, high temperatures, as well as being able to withstand, um, to be able to withstand humidity, high altitudes. And also we've even been tested to for seismic certification during earthquakes. So that means that alkaline fuel cells have a lot to offer for some very diverse use cases in, for industry around the world. Next slide. So uh, basically the sweet spot where we started is in the area of backup power, extremely long duration backup power because the fuel cell is a fantastic complement for the battery and enables you to have very long duration backup and recharge the batteries to keep your uh, power going. So whether we're talking about, um, I mean, with, with climate crisis, of course, weather is worse everywhere and this is causing terrible um, uh, uh, cat catastrophic um, weather phenomenon, which can be anywhere from a, a terrible flood where frequently the diesel generators that are on the ground floor or even in the basements are flooded out and not providing the backup power as needed. Whether it's earthquakes, as I mentioned before, we do, we've with, we, our solutions have already um, been proven to withstand an earthquake in Mexico and wildfires in all these circumstances um, businesses and, uh, and, and communities require very resilient and reliable backup power. Next slide. So if we're thinking about the use cases where you, this backup power can be important, and we can see, first of all, that this year proves obviously how completely uh, uh, mission critical it is to have power to keep those medicines and vaccinations uh, refrigerated at the proper uh, temperature, whether it's to be behind uh, medical surgical interventions that must have power to enable telemedicine and to use the, the sophisticated equipment, as well as for the very, uh, the lifeline that we're all living through, logistics that are shipping products around the world and need to have their uh, logistics systems running 24 seven. So with this, I'd like to um, transfer the, Mike to my colleague and, and mentor, uh, Gil Shavit, our Chief Business Development Officer. Gil? I'd like to... Um, I'm using my uh, iPhone, so uh, I was not able to unmute myself. So I'll try to speak through this uh, application because 
I hope you hear me well. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, taking the uh, whole concept of fuel cells into the area where we are using our long duration backup ability, and uh, I'll give you all the description how to do that, is to go into targeted energy management. And that says uh, that the energy comes from the end to the middle as DER, uh, distributed energy resourcing. And this is where with uh, our already uh, uh, well-developed uh, units as Shelley described, the alkaline fuel cells with uh, just to mention a lot of collaboration with, the, with Professor Leo Elbaz regarding the non metal metals as is mentioned. So we are very uh, appreciating uh, his efforts to support us as well. And uh, I'd like to go to the applications already. And we have started to understand that we are not going to compete with uh, major power plants that are going into hundreds of megawatts. We are reversing the whole concept into internal uh, institutes, uh, as well as uh, residential later, we're talking about creating a 400 volt DC bus. A fuel cell like a battery is a DC uh, direct current uh, generator. And uh, by scaling up the voltage from the uh, average of 40, 48 volts of the uh, fuel cells usually, those kind of fuel cells, we are scaling it up electronically into 400 volt DC where we align to some uh, countries that already regulated 400 volt DC for renewables like Japan. And we are connecting our fuel cells as um, supporters for this grid. So if we have solar, wind, batteries, and also grid, we are all putting in uh, the, uh, even the existing uh, customers uh, another line of, uh, of uh, energy support, which is the 400 volt DC. If we go down to see what it is doing, we can react into uh, DC machines like LED lights directly. We do DC to AC for HVACs. And we also uh, see we are making 400 DC to AC for other equipment like medical equipment. So one of them, and already deployed, and I'll share with you a video in a moment, is combining the DC bus of a hospital in Israel to our new DC bus of what we call a virtual battery. And here's the, here's the concept. Uh, medical equipment becomes more and more dependent on reliable uh, electricity because fluctuations and transitions between uh, diesel generator to the grid and back and forth damaging them. So there are not too many UPS units on those places, mainly because sometimes you need to get the high peaks. And what we are doing is we are uh, building a whole kind of uh, energy farm as you see on the bottom of the picture, which consists a section for the hydrogen resources, which are the cylinders, and on the other side, a farm of fuel cells and the number is changing per need. So we are aggregating all these fuel cells together. And by the end of the day, in the proximity to the load, we allow the hospital to put the UPS with very low amount of batteries, the internal batteries that are with the cabinet, connected to our DC bus to let those batteries be recharged and recharged and charged. Instead of a few minutes, you can go a few days because it's all connected to our fuel cells, which are connected to a, a, a continuous feed uh, of hydrogen. And let me show you this video with your permission. Hi. I'm Shelley Zargari. I'm here at the Hillel Yaffa Medical Center in Israel. Hillel Yaffa is a regional hospital that complies with the green standard for its sustainability objective. And we're here to see a unique zero emission long duration UPS solution, which has been installed by Gencel Energy here at the Cardio Catheterization Labs. Let's take a look. 
Here we are in the cardio catheterization unit where you can see the sophisticated equipment that's used for life-saving catheterization operations. Life-saving catheterization operations require an uninterrupted its fuel cell based long duration UPS power system. This is where the UPS gets its power from the fuel cells. Fueled by the hydrogen stored behind this wall, GenCell's alkaline fuel cells have no noise, no odor, no vibration, and are emission-free. Let's see where the hydrogen is. GenCell's fuel cells, powered by hydrogen, are fueled by the hydrogen in these cylinders, which are safely stored here outside. Fueled by the hydrogen in these safely protected cylinders, the fuel cells can run for hours and days, for as long as hydrogen is available. Okay. We see in the conditions of power outage, the fuel cell kicks in immediately. Now, with the fuel cell-based backup power for long duration, it recharges the batteries that back up the UPS. The energy farm is to serve the entire hospital step by step until the authorities are starting to understand that to get all diesel generated by regulation, operation, operated voluntarily every Friday from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock just to see that we're working, and by the way, throwing tons of CO2 to the atmosphere, this is probably a good way to sell them out from the uh, hospital. That will take years, it's regulated, but the more systems like these are there, the more chances for the good old diesel generators to retire. And this is the mission. As well as I told you, we have this uh, ability to control and to uh, integrate ourselves to existing uh, energy farms that comes from wind and solar, where sometimes the transmission lines are saturated and they cannot transmit all the electricity that are, is available. So it's diverse to hydrogen uh, making by electrolysis and we have our own uh, GenCell EMS, energy management system, to support that and to let this uh, hospital, for example, to go and create its own fuel from its own resources. I see that our time is run out, so I'd like to thank you for that and uh, to let uh, this seminar go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley and Gil. And we will move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker, uh, Dr. Marnik Stenkortener, has both an Israeli as well as a Dutch company. Marnik studied chemistry in Leiden and um, physical chemistry at the Technical University of Delft. He focused on the R&D in electrocatalysis and nanoparticles for hydrogen and C1 conversion. He worked for three years for RWE Essent in renewable energy projects after which he joined Friesland Campina for five years. There he worked on biocatalytic uh, bio milk conversion and new CO2 assisted spray drying processes. And Marnix will tell us about new electrochemical hydrogen fuels, the new way out from the old CO2 crisis. Yes. Um, thank you, um, Racheli. Uh, I'm still not sure if you guys can see the screen. You are we see you, but we do not see your PowerPoint. Ah, okay. I thought it was... We saw it beforehand. Ah, now it's getting on. Great. If you can put it in presentation mode. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. <clears throat> So yes, so Racheli, thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, letting me speak here. Um, Dr. Ten is a small company, 12 people. We started in 2008 and we started in Holland. We got help from the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Holland. And today we have 12 people and about a million euro revenue in a year. Um, like said, I studied 
Um, my master's degree was in zinc air batteries and my PhD was in electrocatalytic conversion of formaldehyde into hydrogen, formate and CO2. It's a long time ago, but I try to kind of build out the subject currently in a more practical mode via the company. We started the company in Jerusalem as well, as we buy materials in Israel and also there's some other reasons. It's a great place for innovation, of course. Um, like I said, I started my life of science in batteries. And so what we did first as a company, we developed a new battery. Uh, it's called CISOL battery. It's a nice battery because it charges 64,000 cycles. It can do 100% discharge. And it's made with sea salt and graphite. And um, yeah, we, we, we got a lot of attention for it. And we tried now to go to mass production. We do hand production in Jerusalem. And we did first demos. And the first demo we did was actually in Groningen in the Netherlands. And um, when you deal with batteries, you deal with salts. And when you deal with salts, you deal with electrolyzers, with sodium hydroxide. And it was immediately a jump to the old PhD subject where I was in. Um, I just put the battery under attention that if anybody's interested in salts, batteries, new batteries, feel most welcome to contact us so that we can um, collaborate perhaps somehow. Battery is getting cheaper, lower cost. It's getting better all the time. And we try to go to mass production, preferably robotized. So we look for bigger funds, investments in order to buy the equipment. We got a great project with the Ministry of Energy in Israel. This is also one of the reasons why I moved to Israel five years ago. Um, and, um, we do demos in Ketura and in Gilboa here in Israel, but we also do projects with the European Commission in Holland. Now, slowly I evolved to the world of CO2, hydrogen, which was the subject of my PhD. Why? Because batteries are great products and we know them for 150 years, but batteries cannot do everything. Batteries, um, are, if we talk about batteries, in general, we actually only talk about two batteries, which is lead acid and lithium. Together, they have a, a, a market of 50 billion euro worldwide. However, we all know that long-term storage or huge amounts of storage also need other ways of storage. Um, a lot of people today say, well, then let's go to hydrogen. You do electrolysis. It's an easy job. You get, um, you get a, a green fuel and job done. The company of Shell, which um, had the professor where I had my PhD with, um, also moved in that direction a long time ago. And they were facing troubles. Why? Because hydrogen is a great road to go and we need to go it, but hydrogen needs to be created. It needs to be stored and it needs to be converted. And each of that step has costs and a loss of efficiency. So people call for green fuels made with hydrogen. We just saw an excellent example from Gencel, which is made, uh, which make fuel cells with ammonia. It's a, it's a great new road that is, we think that society will follow. But there's not only ammonia, there's also others. If you take a picture from the University of Jerusalem, Hebrew University, then you see that for a long time, people have tried to, to, to compress hydrogen or they have tried to, to bind it to cladrata or to other compounds and there were troubles all the time. It was one of the reasons why Shell left the R&D for some part. However, there's more than this. There is, as we all know, gas in front of the sea in Israel. There's gas in front of, 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 of the country in Holland. So we need to do something with hydrogen. And the big question is, what is the new road? 
We also worked on the subject. In 2011, we developed a fuel cell which is made with hydrogen and oxygen. It has hydrogen peroxide. It's one of the options. It's not, it doesn't have a high energy content, but we do believe that it is a road to go. However, I was supposed to talk today about CO2 and the road out from the CO2 problem. Before jumping out of the CO2 problem, it might be smart to analyze the root of the, of the issue. In 1833, Mr. Samuel um, decided to sell seashells. He got uh, a massive, massive import from the far east of these shells. And somewhere around 1900, they decided to set a company in it. It was a shell. Now, if we analyze the shell in more detail, you can say, what is your shell made of actually? What is in the root of the shell? I'm a chemist, so what I tend to do is look at the chemistry first. The chemistry of shell is calcium carbonate. It's calcium bicarbonate. And shells are made in the sea, in the world of sea salt, where we make sea salt batteries from. And if you analyze it, you see that CO2 evolves into shells, into calcium carbonate. This is where shells started in 1900. Now, more than 100 years later, there's troubles in the company at the moment because people say it's polluting or there's other troubles. So the big question is how to proceed. We think that one of the serious options to go is to go back to the root. Analyze if you can make from bicarbonate compounds that will evolve into electricity, into hydrogen. And this was the subject of my PhD. At Oct10, for this reason, in the past years, we did a lot of green fuel cell investigations, uh, uh, green fuel investigations. And of course, formic acid is a famous one. Methanol is a famous one. We all know that methanol is made from gas from the sea. It can be made by the so-called Syngas road, which is done by bus F at first in, I think it was done in 1920 or something. And this is how we built the Western world. However, there's molecules close to CO2 and close to formic acid and methanol that might also be suitable. If you take a look at it, then ammonia was already mentioned. It is a great road to go. But we also see other ones. If you take a look at this picture, then we see that CO2 can be converted to bicarbonate. And this is actually where we have, where we make what we drink in our Coca-Cola or in our Fanta. If you go from bicarbonate in the Poubert diagram to um, formic acid, you can go to formaldehyde next. And formaldehyde can also be made from methanol and from gas. So we think that um, formaldehyde might be a good feedstock for new fuel cells. We worked on it in the past and we have small, small prototypes on lab level. We are not far yet because we focused all the time on the batteries, but still we hope that we can set out a bigger project and we call for partners in this call to join or if there's any project in this field, we would love to line up. Um, we see that formaldehyde can be converted to hydrogen with 100% efficiency. If you realize that, then you do see that you can make a jump from CO2 into formaldehyde and then back from formaldehyde into hydrogen. You release the hydrogen upon oxidation where electrolysis reduces water into hydrogen, formaldehyde oxidation will release hydrogen upon oxidation. It goes the other way around. So we think that together with maybe some partners, we would like to set up a new project where we can demonstrate new fuel cells and where we can also reduce CO2 efficiency. 
if I make the circle a bit more easy, then you see that we have the CO2, it can be turned into bicarbonate, it can be turned into formal, uh, formic acid, and next you can go to methanol. Methanol can be converted with a silver catalyst to formaldehyde, and from formaldehyde you can go to formate and hydrogen. Formate can be reduced back or can be converted to CO2, a circle. For that, you need sodium hydroxide, which is made from salt electrolysis. And in this respect, we have contacts with companies like Norion, and we try to uh, yeah, set, set a demo case in this way. A summary, the advantages of going from formaldehyde, which some people may say it's toxic, but formaldehyde can be polymerized to paraformaldehyde, can be added to a fuel cell, and from there on, you have 100% hydrogen release on one side and oxygen reduction on the other side. The professor that was just talking about oxygen reduction free, uh, of a platinum free oxygen reduction catalyst, is most welcome to contact us too, so that we could perhaps see that we can make good oxygen electrodes. And also, Jensel, uh, we asked this question. Now, we try to get on this point and we try to get on this fuel cell and we hope that we can demonstrate it in Groningen and we'd like to do it together. Back to the CO2 question. How to get rid of the CO2 problem that we created partly from the company called Shell. The Shell is actually called a Jacob Shell and the Jacob Shell contains the solution already for a long time to solve its own problem. By going to carbonate and by going to formate, by going to formaldehyde, we can create a, a storage medium for hydrogen. And from there on, we can create green electricity that solves the CO2 problem. Thank you. Wow, Marnix, thank you very, very much. And uh, maybe I can share with you something personal. I uh, grew up in the Netherlands, in Utrecht. And uh, when we used to go um, by car to different places, uh, we, among others, also went to take fuel in the Shell gas stations. And when I was a child, every time that we tanked for fuel, you could get a shell. And this is how I uh, uh, slowly gathered a whole beautiful shell collection which unfortunately, when I immigrated with my family to Israel, um, did not arrive. So I still miss my shell uh, collection, but uh, it is a nice recollection um, following um, the, uh, <clears throat> the example that you just gave Marnix. What I also like is that I have heard now over and over the wish and the will to collaborate. And this is really the essence of, uh, of my work at the embassy. And um, now we can move on to our next speaker, Dr. Sonia Davidson. She is the CEO of Hydrogen Energy Now. I do mention that she's a female founder of a startup involved in creating hydrogen using electromagnetic waves. And um, Sonia is a very academic person too. She has five academic degrees. She is fascinated by science and she has made finals in numerous uh, competitions. Sonia, the floor is yours. Great. I hope you can see my screen present, presently. We do. Great. Um, our company has a why. We want to leave the world a better place for our children and our grandchildren. And this slide also means something special to me this week because we're in a contest called Spacecom Entrepreneur. They're talking about new technologies in space and hydrogen in space is a possibility. Um, if you look at the problem in the grid right now, and this is from the European exchange market, um, it shows that renewable energy is not stored. And because of that, it ends up with an instable grid. Um, Off-grid power is around 10, peak power is around 50. If you could store energy, you can realize 5x on your return, which is pretty amazing. If you looked at California, in 2020, 
there was presently 1.46 terawatts of power that was generated that could not be used by the grid. And at the same time, um, I learned just yesterday that a portion of California did not have electricity because they weren't able to generate power at that time. So it's a, if you could store power, you can change the way the grid is. And renewable power is becoming um, a bigger problem because without storage, you need to store it. Hydrogen is a solution. Um, it's an amazing molecule. It, it can play an enormous role in the next generation of power generation delivery and storage. Our technology involves the production of hydrogen. I think we've heard a little bit about other people back to electricity in hydrogen oxygen fuel cells, a little bit about hydrogen storage, which the most common method right now is compression. And the other methods are H2 energy now, which is used in electromagnetic waves and electrolysis. Electromagnetic waves um, has resulted in is a new method for generating hydrogen from water, adding energy to the vibration of the water molecule, which ends in its separation. Are we, uh, this is a patented process. Um, if you compare H2 energy now versus electrolysis, you see that we're more efficient in our lab testing. Um, we're light and easily transport. Our capital costs are 50% less because we're not using any platinum in our process. And we actually prototype using salt water. We could use fresh water plus an electrolyte, um, but we decided to use salt water in our first testing. Um, our patents were granted in 2019 in Europe and the USA. Um, in 2020, we have additional patents granted in Great Britain, France, and Germany. Um, in 2020, we had our first virtual intern um, from Iowa. Um, our, in the right is me with our machine with Albert Einstein. Um, our machine is about 42 centimeters by 110 centimeters. Um, if you look at the addressable market, you see the large energy storage market, which is projected to be 500 billion by 2025, but actually it's going to become a lot quicker than that. The initial um, market we see for our technology is large scale solar and wind farms in US, Europe, Japan, and China. Our goal is to take 2% of the market, or about 2 billion in five years. Um, we formed a team of advisors, mentors. Um, one of the amazing things about startup companies, if you have a, an amazing technology and you're willing to share some of it, you get all kinds of amazing people come and volunteer and help with your company. Um, we've had interns, we've had two MBA students just recently from Ben Gurion University with us. Uh, ben, uh, Vanderbilt University will be starting shortly with us. Um, and we have some other people coming on board shortly. Uh, it's, but it's an amazing way to, if you sell your idea, your technology, people will come from all over the world. And this is a hard tech, which is very easy. Um, again, we're projected to make a lot of money, which is good. Um, and the reason is that our product is half the cost of an electrolysis machine. Um, we've had quite a few milestones. We're in Spacecom Entrepreneurial, um, Vanderbilt University, uh, decarbonization of shipping, because um, as I was talking to several shipping firms in Netherlands, et cetera, they're looking for clean power to be generated uh, because it's a demand that's being pushed on the, on the uh, shipping industry. There's already presently one hydrogen ship on uh, being run that way. Um, we believe in putting our company out there. One of the things we did was we entered a contest in the United States called NASA iTech, which your technology was viewed by the 12 at 12 regional centers of NASA in the United States. And they gave us an award saying the potential impact your idea may have on future spe space exploration and the benefit of humanity. Um, presently, we were involved in scaling up our process to 100 kilograms of hydrogen a day. 
our power input about 430 kilowatts. Uh, so if you take that times three, you can see we need about three machines to get one megawatt, which is, is what you start to talk about when you talk about large scale um, solar and wind farms. Um, and again, our scale up cost is half of, um, our capex is half of uh, electrolysis and our opex is significantly less. We believe that this is a technology, a new technology that can change the world. Uh, we know we need clean energy. Hydrogen-based storage will make this possible. Uh, my email is Sonia at H2 Energy Now. I'll add it to the discussion group and I'd be happy to talk to everyone. Thank you again. My name is Sonia Davidson and this is H2 Energy Now. Thank you very much, Sonia. And as you finished a little bit earlier, we will move on to our last speaker, Frank Wouters, and this will leave us some time also for a discussion. Um, so, so far we've had really a description of technologies and ecosystems developed in the Netherlands and in Israel. And now we are going to expand a little bit beyond the Israeli-Dutch uh, axis. And that is um, now we're going to move to the east and into Dubai. Um, it is not that there is no link with the Netherlands as Frank Wouters is uh, originally from the Netherlands, but I'd like to bring this in, a, in, in a perspective that when we are talking about possibilities of hydrogen production in Israel uh, using solar energy, as you said, Patrick, another thing that we could foresee is maybe transportation of clean hydrogen from the Gulf countries to um, Europe through Israel and maybe using some of the conversion technologies that are being developed uh, in Israel. So Frank is a leading uh, expert in sustainable energy projects, transactions and technology development for the last 28 years. He, plays a role, he played a role in the development of renewable uh, ge uh, generation projects valued over four and a half billion dollars and these projects range from small-scale uh, photovoltaic solar electrification in Uganda to the 100 megawatt Shams-1 concentrated solar power plant in the United Emirates. And also strategic equity uh, investments in the, uh, in the London Array, which is the largest offshore wind project. As Deputy Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, the first global intergovernmental organization dedicated to all renewables, Frank managed a $350 million IRENA Abu Dhabi fund for development project facility for renewable energy. Frank has a, pro a proven track record of advice to public power sector agencies, and, he's, and he currently serves as a global lead uh, as a global lead green hydrogen at Worley, he is a director of the EU GCC Clean Energy Technology Network. He is a director of Gore Street Capital London, and he is advising the World Bank on solar energy around the world. Frank, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Acheli, and um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, you today. Um, it, uh, you, you've heard uh, there's a couple of rules that I, I serve. Uh, as director of the EU GCC Clean Energy Technology Network, we try to foster clean energy technology partnerships between Europe and the Gulf. And uh, of course, I'm excited about the Abraham Accords and would like to expand that relationship, including uh, Israel. Uh, so that is certainly something to, uh, to follow up on, especially in, uh, in, in the space of hydrogen and, and other clean fuel. So today I would like uh, to take you through uh, a couple of uh, slides First, um, you know, try to better understand what hydrogen is, uh, then the role hydrogen might play in Europe. And, uh, and lastly, uh, you know, the main idea of, of this presentation is a, a European Hydrogen Act. Now, let's start with uh, the main question, why hydrogen? And I, I like this picture because it's, um, you know, obviously it's a tragedy. We've seen uh, the floods in uh, all over the world, but this was a picture in, in July, 2020. Uh, in Japan, uh, and, and if you look closely, then, uh, you know, most of the roofs actually have uh, solar panels. So part of, you know, the issue with climate change is obviously, um, you know, burning of fossil fuels and Japan is, is at the moment heavily reliant on burning coal for electricity. Uh, you know, so solar uh, helps mitigate emissions uh, from that, but, but perhaps this picture is, is you know, 
showing that maybe we've done too little too late. Um, just to get a, you know, an overview over what the various roles of hydrogen are. I mean, these are the seven functions of, uh, of hydrogen in the energy system. First of all, it's an enabler, especially green hydrogen is an enabler of large scale renewables integration uh, and the power generation. It's very cost effective to transport molecules over long distances, much more cost effective than electrons. Uh, you can store um, molecules loss-free over seasons, which is an important element uh, in an energy system. And then the four main use cases are in transportation, uh, industrial energy use, buildings, uh, and, and lastly, and this is certainly something where electrons can never work, it's, uh, it's as an industrial feedstock. Now, if we then focus on the electricity system alone, this is, uh, this is a picture that shows a number of META studies in uh, for Europe, uh, you know, Germany, Sweden, Spain, and the entire continent. And on the, on, the, on the horizontal axis, you see the share of variable renewable energy as part of the electricity system. Uh, and on the vertical axis, you see the requirement for hydrogen as a stabilizing element in the electricity system in terms of storage and, and just making the system work. Uh, and then, you know, this was sort of last year, uh, not just Germany, but the entire continent relied for the first time for more than 50% on variable renewables. And that's, a, you know, mostly solar and wind. Uh, of course, there is hydro. Um, but if, if you then zoom in on the, you know, how much hydrogen you would need uh, to stabilize that system, it's still very modest, uh, almost nothing. But going forward, if we're, you know, looking at a decarbonized energy system by 2050, which has to be net zero carbon, uh, then the electricity system definitely needs to be 100% uh, renewables. You cannot burn uh, hydrocarbons any longer. And then, you know, a sort of middle of the road uh, estimation of the requirements of, of hydrogen to make that system work uh, could already amount to 20%. So this is just the electricity system, already quite significant uh, role for hydrogen uh, in, in electricity. Now, um, this is a picture of, um, you know, the executive vice president Franz Stillemans of the European Commission, together with Professor Art van Dijk and the way from Hulst. We met him in, uh, in, in Brussels. We had just uh, finished a North Africa Europe Hydrogen Manifesto, which basically looked at 2050 at the, at the European energy system, uh, you know, with a particular focus on, on hydrogen. Uh, the, I think uh, previous speakers have, have mentioned this before, that Europe is never going to be energy independent. Even if you uh, do as much as, as you can with, with solar and wind, uh, and, and then the, the additional demand uh, you cover with hydrogen, which you, by the way, also have to make with solar and wind to a large extent, um, you know, it would just be too much. The, the, the continent is too um, congested. Uh, and there is cheaper option. So one of the things that we then looked at was where, where can you import hydrogen from? It, it's very natural to look at your neighbors. Uh, so Ukraine uh, and, and North Africa seem, seem very close. You can actually uh, connect that with pipelines, which is already the case right now. And then you can continue to do that also with molecules of the future. Now, taking that uh, piece of work forward, that was until 2050, we, we also then Look at what do we need to do until 2030, and that resulted in the two times 40 gigawatt initiative, which we published with Hydrogen Europe, uh, and that has now found a place in the in the European uh, hydrogen strategy that was released uh, on the 8th of July last year. So the, the the European strategy refers to the two times 40 gigawatt initiative, and, and it's become a, the target, if you will. So 40 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity in Europe, uh, but in addition an import component of 40 gigawatts. And, and that hasn't you know, very, uh, been defined uh, very concretely, but reference again uh, to North Africa, Ukraine, and further afar. So these are the outlines of the, um, of the European hydrogen strategy. Uh, there's a very clear focus on, on green, although recognition is that uh, blue hydrogen, which is, you know, typically steam methane reforming of natural gas, which you capture, you capture the CO2 as a role. Um, if, if you then translate into concrete numbers, 1 million ton of, of uh, hydrogen by 2024 and 10 million ton by 2030. Uh, and for that, you need at least six gigawatts of electrolyzer by 2024 
and 40 gigawatts installed by 2030. Uh, again, a role for import, and, and obviously you need quite a bit of money to make those investments. That is, uh, that is clear. Now, if we then look at, and, and this is a picture for Germany, but it, it's roughly the same for the entire continent. Uh, if you then look at how, how does the, the energy system work right now? Now, electrons, electricity, um, e even though we've made most pro progress in decarbonization uh, through, as I mentioned already, 50% renewable power right now, in the electricity sector, that is only 20% of final energy. So the bulk of the energy demand at the moment uh, is 80% is, is, 80 is, uh, is molecules. So that's coal, natural gas, uh, all kinds of fuels, etc. And the greenification of that uh, is much less than in the electricity sector. So there, we've only managed to do 9%. So overall, you know, we still have 80% carbon intensity in the energy system, uh, even though already 50 in the electricity sector. Now, if we then um, see what we need to do to get to a net zero carbon uh, system, we need to increase, um, you know, the, the portion of green and the electricity part of things, um, but also we need to massively increase electrification. So those two trends uh, are, are there and very clear. Um, we also need to introduce obviously more clean molecules because in the end, you know, we need to go uh, to 100% uh, green electrons and 100% green uh, molecules. Um, and that is in, in numbers, uh, 1250 roughly, um, a terawatt hours of electrons and 1,250 terawatt hours of molecules in the entire continent. It would be 10,000, so 5,000, 5,000. Uh, and that would then consist of 100% uh, green uh, power. But uh, on the molecules, we have a number of options. Um, biofuels, we've seen the presentation from Chemelot uh, that you can do things with biomass, obviously, um, but there is limitations to that. There is all kinds of of issues with sustainability, um, you know, competition with food, et cetera. Of course, we can do a lot more with waste, et cetera, uh, but it's not unlimited. Carbon capture and storage, uh, again, absolutely important, but again, limited uh, in, in, in geography, in geology, and, in, in, uh, you know, in its application, and in the end, also cost. And then we're left with hydrogen and all kinds of things that you can make with hydrogen. And of those options, so the 50% of the energy system uh, that we um, uh, that that we need that are molecules. Um, you know, I, I believe that hydrogen is by by far uh, the solution with um, uh, you know the biggest opportunity to scale, get to lower cost, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Now, what do we need to do? Uh, one of the things uh, that um, uh, Europe needs to do next uh, is work on regulation. I mean, if They've set, they've set the, the ambition, there's a strategy, it has these concrete targets, et cetera, but it's very still very lean in policy detail. Uh, and then if you look at um, you know, the ambition level, it's quite high, they make reference to a target of 24% share of final energy. Um, just to put that into monetary terms, the Hydrogen Council has an estimation of 18% of hydrogen of final energy by 2050 for the entire planet. And then you're talking about a two and a half trillion dollar industry, which is bigger than oil and gas combined. Europe has a higher ambition. Um, so in that sense, uh, it, it's going to be big, uh, irrespective of, of what's, what's going to happen. But then if you look at where uh, is the debate currently taking place on hydrogen, it's all over the place. It, it's being debated in the electricity sector because of course you can do, you, you have to make it in the end from, from, from power in the gas sector, in the industrial sector, in the fuel sector, the transport sector, et cetera, et cetera. And that doesn't, doesn't help. So our proposal is to get from this, you know, all over the place approach uh, to get to a central place where you talk about, um, um, you know, a regulatory framework for, for hydrogen, which you know, in our view is going to be an important uh, pillar of the energy system. And from that central place, inform uh, all the other legislation that touch upon the different sectors. And with that, I come to the worst slide of the whole presentation. I apologize. This is usually not something for a presentation, um, but it does capture everything. Um, basically, the proposal is to define a hydrogen act that looks at two things. 
infrastructure and markets, and that we roll out over three phases. So we have an initial phase, the kickstart phase, as we call it, uh, with an ele element uh, that, that focuses on infrastructure and on markets. Uh, and that is, you know, to get to the six gigawatts, to get to the one million ton by 2024, uh, you do the hydrogen valleys, we've seen the fantastic uh, project in, in Koning, but there's more of those. There is IPSES, which are international projects of common European interest, which at the moment, you know, probably looser state aid guidelines are being, uh, being discussed. You have to start working on pipelines, perhaps blending, perhaps converting already. Uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, how, how to make that work from a market perspective, you have to, you know, basically think about subsidies uh, and, and all of those things, because at the moment, you know, it's just more expensive. So on, on, unless you, uh, you introduce, um, you know, either quota or subsidies, you know, it wouldn't happen. Then you have a ramp up phase until 2035. And, and in that phase, basically, we're going to cost competitiveness. So you, you start, then you get a ramp up phase where you, um, uh, you know, you do blending, you start working on, on these hydrogen valleys, you build a backbone, um, you start stimulation program of the production as well as demand. I mean, those things, they go hand in hand. Uh, and you need to work on, on all kinds of mechanisms such as guarantees of origin um, and, um, you know, perhaps also against you know, subsidies and all kinds of mechanisms that you need. You need to develop that market. But once you've done all that and you have the volumes and you have the cost uh, achieved, that the cost reduction achieved that you would like to achieve so that it is competitive, then you're getting into you know, the market growth phase, which would en enable you to look at the last conversion of the gas infrastructure, uh, you know, to work on, if you will, normal market mechanisms of supply and demand that pricing takes place in in marketplaces, just like any other molecule or you know electron that that you do right now, guarantees of origin. I think they'll always be be important. Also, when uh, you have a competitive market, because people will still want to know what they're buying, and and that is in the end the underlying currency for that. And with that, um, I'm done. Thank you very much. And maybe with this slide, um, with the Q&A, we can now open our microphones. Um, Leo, if you can help me open all microphones so that we can have a vivid discussion. Um, seven speakers um, and the floor is all ours. 53 participants, please feel free to ask a question. It's uh, the option to open the, the microphone is open to everybody. So you can just unmute yourself. If there are no questions to start with, maybe I will make a comment. At the embassy, my job is to develop R&D collaboration between Israel and the Netherlands. And these mini symposia are one means to do so. But at the embassy, we also have a representative of what we call the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, which could be um, interesting for Israeli startups that are interested in scaling up in the Netherlands. And in order to scale up in the Netherlands, I think that the presentations, uh, both of Patrick, of what's happening in the northern part of the Netherlands, as well as of uh, Mark from the southern part, could be of interest to you. And there are uh, landing pads in, an, uh, in the Netherlands for Israeli startups that would like to scale up. And maybe also to ask uh, Patrick and uh, Mark a question. Um, we often in Israel regard our startups as um, something that could be of interest to large companies to tap into. And do you think that from your region, there could be interest in scouting for Israeli technology in the field of hydrogen? Yes, Rosely, I am I'm convinced that, 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 that is, uh, that's a good opportunity to engage in that just need to let's say have a list of potentials and try to bring them together with uh, let's say uh, interested parties in our region and there beyond of course because it's not only about our region because we, we try not to work in splendid isolation but try to spread uh, the knowledge and the word of course in, in that respect so uh, I think we are very open to uh, get engaged with um, with let's say mm -hmm. technology providers 
uh, uh, like for instance, the, the ones we, we saw just now, it's very interesting. And uh, I think we, we should have a go at trying to combine some of the, let's say, the, the request and demand parties on that side. Yeah, maybe I can say something. I think we look at, at, at our site, especially for technologies that do give a very good fit with, uh, with, uh, with our abilities. And uh, especially the startups that, uh, that we saw, or scale-ups actually, that we saw today, um, are, uh, a number of them are, are very interesting. And we have uh, already uh, contacted uh, uh, contacts with them to see what would be the best fit and what could be the best proposition that, uh, that we can make. And of course, it has advantages to, uh, to have a, an address in uh, Europe um, especially if you wish to assess, let's say, all the uh, uh, fundings and, and finances uh, that are available uh, within Europe. And that, that would, yeah, that would help, of course, a lot. And uh, we have quite some experience also in our campus with, uh, with facilitating startups and growing startups to, uh, to make them investor ready and, and, and to create, uh, uh, let's say, a good start uh, uh, for them in Europe. Thank you. Professor Elbaz, are you around? I'm here. Okay, maybe you could say something about the possibility of linking the ecosystem in the Gulf countries, which is represented now, um, just to, to be practical, by Frank Wouters, and Europe, uh, thinking about the Europe Act and also knowing Israel with all the uh, capabilities that we have. Maybe you could say something about the vision of the uh, National Israeli uh, Center for Energy. So, um, well, thank you for raising that. Um, we, 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 see, we see the opportunities in the Middle East, uh, not only for you know, making a greener world, but also a more peace, peaceful world. And, and we're now making those links to, to countries. So I, I would like first to reach out to Frank and ask him if, if he could try to make connections. This is bigger than just energy. This is also uh, important for, for stabilizing the region. Uh, we, we are now in, in touch with uh, the UAE and we're going to have a workshop uh, uh, next week to try to establish, establish some formal relationship between uh, um, research, research institutes. Um, I think Israel is, is, is in uh, uh, an important junction, uh, as it's always been, for different uh, uh, both technologies and, and uh, scenarios in the world. Um, today, uh, we, we see a great movement uh, from, from Saudi Arabia uh, trying to, to produce uh, large quantities of energy uh, and, and considering uh, conveying that energy, as, as also Frank suggested, uh, in the form of molecules, so basically uh, uh, transforming it to hydrogen and then, and then uh, transporting it to the east and the west. Mm -hmm. and, and Israel could be a sort of a gateway uh, to, to Europe uh, for, for hydrogen. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the town that uh, Saudi Arabia is, is basically targeting for production of, of large quantities of hydrogen this is by far one of the largest projects in the world today. Uh, numbers are reaching about half a trillion dollars uh, in the city of Neom, a uh, new city, which is about uh, 70 kilometers south of Elat, the southest uh, city of Israel. Uh, so th that, that, that could be very interesting. Okay, so out... I would like, can I just pose another question to another speaker? Sorry for, for interrupting you. Marnix, uh, we have been talking about a possibility of setting up a demonstration center in Israel. Could you elaborate on that a little bit and see whether we can get the interest uh, from our Dutch partners for such an idea? Yes. Um... Well, I can, I can think in two directions. One direction is that you say you got, of course, a lot of good, great Israeli inventors here, out of the box thinkers, smart prototypers that would like to get the connection to Europe and to Holland. Um, I do see that there is a group uh, that, that, that likes to demonstrate this and, and line up with the initiatives in Limburg and Groningen. Um, also others, of course, but on the, on the reverse, I am also lined up with uh, what Mr. Lior Albas said. There's a huge Arabic city going to be built just outside of Eilat. 
And I heard there's a 200 billion investment, 200 billion uh, euro is going to be invested in that city to make it completely renewable. So it could also help Dutch companies to export their salts, their chemicals, their carbons, whatever they have in specialties uh, via Israel or with a showcase center in Jerusalem to that city. So we feel a little bit that Israel and of course Jerusalem is the heart of innovation. And as a company, we were in this place now for four or five years and we realized, okay, um, if that fits so good to us, then maybe there is more base for it. And maybe more people line, uh, yeah, would like to line up with that innovation center. Um, and yes, it could be a connection on, from one leg into Groningen and Limburg, and perhaps on the reverse also be the jump out to the new Arabic market that's opening straight up from Israel at the moment. Thank you, Marnik. Are there any other comments? If not, then I would like to end the, uh, our mini symposium, just bringing to your attention that in the next few weeks, we will announce our next hydrogen um, mini symposium in which Professor Art van Wijk, who was mentioned by uh, Frank Bouders, uh, will be a plenary speaker. And we will focus on the field of electrolyzers with Nurion, who, who was mentioned uh, during our call with the uh, Israeli startup H2 Pro, which just won the new energy challenge of Shell and uh, Rockstar, as well as TNO, the Applied Research uh, Organization of the Netherlands. And I would like to thank you. We will circulate the uh, presentations. We have a recording of our meeting um, and you will hear from us and we invite you to make new collaborations. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Ocheli. Thank you very much, Ocheli. Thank you. Bye-bye, Thank you for all the work. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent symposium as usual. Thank you, Ocheli. Thank you. Ocheli waiting room? Yes. One Bedankt second. Ocheli, uitstekend georganiseerd. Thank you well. Yeah. One second, uh, Jochem, we would like to talk to you. We are... Sampet Kulamba. Watch the Okay. Just a sec, Jochem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take your time. Hello, Lior, by the way, I didn't say hi to you. Hi, Joachim. Hi. What is that on your background? That doesn't look like Israel to me. No, no, it's uh, it's my favorite corner in uh, Utrecht. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I think it's now just the three of us, right? Yeah. I also helped you move people to the... Uh, the... Yeah, it's wow. Nice. Great. Are, are you stopping the recording? Just... Off the record.